ओके हेलो हाय हाय गुड आफ्टरनून हे हाउ आर यू आई एम गोइंग फाइन लेट मी जस्ट पुट माय आउटलुक क्विट माय आउटलुक सो दैट वी या ओह माय गॉड व्हाट अ मॉर्निंग आई हैड आई हैव हैड अ प्रीटी <laughs> Pretty interesting morning, you know. Yes, <laughs> I saw you in the kusini, in Sudha's kusini. Sudha's kusini, yeah. <laughs> so, how did it go? Well, you know, it's uh, it's very interesting. It was a completely different experience, you know, to cook live with um, uh, with with somebody else telling you what you're doing, what to do, or to be in sync with all the others, um, and. <laughs> the whole thing was in french as you know so you know i mean uh, suda was speaking i mean the majority of the people were were francophone and the instructions and the discussion was in french and uh, usually i don't find this a problem because i've always um i've always been um in this kind of a mode with my friends in french you know i have friends who are francophone i don't you know i learned yeah. to pick up on what's going on around me because of the way people talk but usually it's uh, in the context you know you're going out to dance or you ask somebody uh, on the dance floor no, how are you you should, should have done your kusini dancing then could have been easier for you <laughs> i was dancing anyway i was dancing <laughs> oh my god and the, the the worst thing was i don't i'm a good cook but i don't make desserts and i don't use the oven to cook sweets so it was very very complicated to do this fondant for the first time in french live you know so yeah. that you have really <laughs> you have really challenged me salam nice to see you nice to see our friends here so anyway so i am today i'm i'm a bit exhausted because of this challenge and you're going to have to take charge of the no uh, way No way. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, no way. No, Hello. No. You, you, you. Nobody asks you to go to the kusini and get exhausted, knowing that you are at that today. So you. <laughs> that you discuss. You you sort that out with uh, with uh, Sudha. She's the one who scheduled the kusini, not me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Aisha. <laughs> Hi, Aisha. So uh, thanks, thanks for your wishes. Salut, oh, salut, salut, ma chan. Comment vas-tu? So basically, anyway, now it's 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 at that time. Kusini is over in the morning. People, just to tell everybody, since uh, we are going on live, uh, our friend Suda of Suda Cuisine, uh, Christina, Christina, you are extremely diligent. Double presence, huh? Morning and evening, afternoon and night for you and Pondicherry. Thank you for supporting us. Um, and uh, hi, Sarah, hi. hi. Selina, so people um, follow Sudha Cuisine's page. She did a live this morning in um, order to raise uh, funds for um, a group of women in Pondicherry, and that um, the Pondicherry part of disbursing the funds is being managed by uh, Ari's dear friend Lydia. Um, so Lydia also came on the live to explain what was going on. If you go and watch the live replay, you'll have the amusement of watching me trying to cook fondant for the first time But in French. See, I was, I was, I, I will not promote this event because I'm, I'm really, really angry that men was not invited. Were not invited. So that you can ask. You ask yeah, Sudha that why. That's the, that's the most sexist, sexist cuisine I ever seen. So I'm not going to promote that event at all. Is <laughs> that you sort it out with Sudha? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, anyway, kidding. anyway, enough of cuisine. Now you tell me uh, what 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 are you doing otherwise, other than being annoyed uh, about not being invited to the party? <laughs> I I am the most happiest guy, as you know. Uh, yes, of course. Congratulations. So congratulations. my book is my book is coming out soon. Yeah. Next week, I think, should be out because. Fantastic. It has been sent to the print uh, on on Friday. Yeah. Exactly when I received the cover. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I am extremely happy. And um, yeah. 
So again, everyone, uh, I'm sure people have got wind of this already, but uh, Ari's uh, third uh, book, his uh, first collection of short stories, Nouvelle, uh, they are going to be uh, imminently in the world under the uh, title of uh, Nocturne Pondicherry. Uh, some comment, somebody commented on your page saying, why is it Nocturne Pondicherry and not Nocturne Pondicherryenne or whatever, you know? Uh, well... <laughs> You see, that, that, that's that's what happens when you when you want to, merci Akka, when you want to, you know, uh, break the norms. Yeah, exactly. So and, uh, when you break the norms, people. Thank you, Raj. Uh, by the way, ta, Raj, uh, thank you, and also happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. Yep. Yeah, we keep them all in mind. Yeah. So, um, so yes, uh, this is, of course, a wonderful moment for all of us because we are so happy that Nocturne Pondicherry is out in the world imminently. Uh, everybody, this is a really exciting, uh, very interesting collection of uh, short stories. Um, Thank, of you, of Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, some of the stories are longer than the others. You know, very fascinating. I, I have... I have enjoyed them behind the scenes from even before they were becoming, I mean, before we knew exactly which ones were going to go into this La Maton collection, I think you already uh, had sent me some to read. And I was, I'm very fascinated by these short stories because they really cast um, Ponicherry in a different light from that uh, idea that we might get uh, a stereotyped idea of, of what can be produced from the pen of a so-called writer of historical fiction, you know. So it's uh, quite a different, um, you know, entry into Pondicherry. I think these short yeah, stories. Yeah, you know, you know, as you know, that I, I, I started to write short stories between when I finish. Uh, thank you, Dabi. Thank you. And also, happy belated birthday to you too. And uh, when I finished Kanesu Kadlakshmi, and I was starting Tinai, and I wanted to do something in between. Mm -hmm. And Tinai, since Tinai re requires so much of uh, 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 research, mm -hmm. so you know I, I, I need to keep my writing going. So I started a, like very randomly one short story, mm -hmm. and uh, I liked it, and I sent it to a couple of people, and they said this is really good. So then it became, and when I'm tired of writing the novel. I always write one short story in between. So just to know. And now I found out a new, another, uh, another, um, another form, which is the flash fictions. Yeah, yeah. That was what kind of a pandemic uh, mode. Yeah, uh, flash fictions. That yeah. also I like. Uh, so, you know, just give a different variation, uh, variation. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Jocelyn. Hi, Céline. Hi, Céline. My survive, fellow survivor of, of Sudas Kusini. Uh, <laughs> I, I must say that was an experience. Uh, we yeah. are forever bonded by this memory. <laughs> um, I hope so you, too. Me, I so have already, Amini, I've already started thinking about the English translations. I, I, I can't do them. I think it's too complicated for me to do them. I can handle your flash fictionary, but the entire, I mean, you know, it, it's really for somebody who has a little bit more competence. So uh, we hope we hope this, this happens soon because I think um, you have a big public who wants to read you in English, Ari. So we must we must make sure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Jocelyn. Um, so um, let's hope that we soon um, find uh, find a pub uh, a translator, find a publisher who will take the translation up, and uh, you know. These things are a little um, serendipitous, you know. When uh, something clicks with a publisher, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah you, no. you'll have. Yeah, but the, the 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 big advantage being here, uh, of course, Larmaton uh, being on the prestigious yeah. uh, publisher. Yeah. So it's kind of validation. You see? Yes. Oh, for so sure. That makes things more much more easier. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So let's hope something yeah. something comes out. Let's hope so. Fingers crossed. But sooner rather than later, um, I mean, for sure, uh, we'll we'll make we'll we'll, we'll make, make it happen, you know. And uh, these are very very interesting short stories, as I said. They're a bit bit dark, you know, um, bit sardonic. Some of them. They're not they're not sentimental. They're not mushy. <laughs> oh no no no! I, I you know me you no. Know, I, I I hate yeah. that type of 
Yeah. Like yeah. so, uh, Kajdore, it's a little, you know, from the... Uh, I think Kajdore, uh, Kajdore, the golden cage, uh, yeah. is the only one that's uh, a little, a little, that could be, could be, could be called uh, for, you know, giving, giving space for a little bit of sentimentality. But I think placed in the overall context of the others, uh, for sure, it's uh, a different uh, feeling about Pondicherry uh, that comes out. And I think that's, that's why I said in the post that I made, you know, firstly, uh, the challenge for post-colonial critics and theorists to deal with um, material coming out uh, in French from India, you know, we really have to <laughs> change the the mode of uh, assuming what is literature from post-colonial India, what are the languages of this literature, and so on. Um, then, you know, you have to think about memory. What is this particular writing remembering? Um, and uh, you have to think about uh, the stakes, you know, as you say in French, uh, les enjeux, you know, what is at stake? Mm in this particular kind of memory for this particular place, how is it connected with the uh, contemporary, the rest of India, which is uh, surrounding it? I mean, Pondicherry is not, is not independent of how um, it connects or has to connect with contemporary India, which uh, most of that India comes through the sieve of British India. And, and Pondicherry, like Goa, you know, there are these little alternative uh, colonial histories, yet the post-colonial present is assimilating everything and putting it together. So what does that mean, you know? So I, I really think that this this is why these, I said that uh, the more literature that comes out of Pondicherry, the more the particularity of Pondicherry will have to be acknowledged as something completely, not, um, not just a little deviation, but a way to rethink the whole, not a deviation from the whole, but a way to rethink, you know, what post-coloniality in India actually means. So anyway, because of all these reasons, we need the translations and maybe they also, we need the translations into Tamil, you know, I know that uh, Joe Prabhakaran is trying to do some work um, on that, no? A move towards Creole ghost with Nocturne. Uh. <laughs> that, will, that will come, Risha. But, you know, uh, let me take this opportunity also to launch um, an appeal, uh, as we say in, in French, because this is not about one day about me. And this book is out, and Lamaton, the person who is in charge of that collection, yeah. has asked me that I need to open the way to other okay. writers yeah. uh, from India, Pondicherry, where, wherever they are, mm -hmm. if you know anyone writing in French from India, please let me know. I will help them to publish Lamato. So this is I'm uh, I'm sending this message to, to out, out in the world. If you know anyone from uh, from your entourage, uh, friends, whoever it is, uh, uh, Indians who are writing, not necessarily being Indians. But uh, anyone writing about uh, India in French. So yeah. contact me. I will definitely help them to publish in Lamata. So that is my, I, I'm kind of, um, uh, so <laughs> you know, the main guy is there, but since he doesn't have, he doesn't have access to, to, yeah. to Indians or other people. So he asked me to do that. And I'm already helping. Uh, which I'm not saying the word, the, the, the name now, uh, someone from Pondicherry who is going to publish to me in La Mato. It's coming out soon. Well, you know, this is the way a good publisher works like that because the, the whole um, matter is a bit under the radar, um, you know, and also there's been, um, you know, you wrote that very uh, interesting essay on uh, where is Indian Francophone literature. Um, and uh, in that you very precisely uh, explained why the matter of voices from Pondicherry, it, it, it's not like there's a whole bunch of them. And where are they? And that doesn't also mean that there should be none, you know. And uh, that uh, you, that essay ha was was uh, translated by me, and we published it in Scroll India. Nevertheless, it has been republished in its original French form on uh, Le Tinai Revi. So everyone, you know, uh, please uh, keep 
checking uh, Tinai Revi. It's our new, uh, it's our new uh, journal space. Uh, people, you you know it exists, and you uh, we we talked about it in the last uh, Adda. So um, we put in there. Our yeah, list. exactly. So uh, see, the, even my my bio, my my new book. Uh, this is what my bio is saying. Uh, Harry Gauthier est un écrivain et poète français d'origine indo-malgache, ayant pour objectif d'épingler Pondichéry yes. sur la carte littéraire franco française. Exactly. Yeah. Harry Gauthier a pour ambition de faire connaître la littérature francophone indienne. So this is very, uh, uh, what do you call? It's in my it's in my bio. Yeah. And people know what I'm trying to do. And what is my my goal is to uh, is to put Pondicherry in the literary map, in the French literary map, and also to help people writing in French to be published. I mean, in a way, it's a uh, kind of analogous, a parallel. My God, it's it's really warm. Sorry, I need to open my window. Okay, Let's it's parallel on. to what uh, Anita is doing with. Uh, <coughs> culinary with gastronomy of, of Pondicherry, you know, Anita, you with Shea Pushpa, you are putting Pondicherry on a cultural map by uh, showcasing in different ways the gastronomic heritage of Pondicherry. And I mean, Ari wants to do something, is, is doing something similar with the literary heritage. I see all these moves as a very interesting, um, you know, a kind of conjoined effort uh, to, to kind of really push this submerged memory uh, of Pondicherry and culture, um, not just a memory of the culture, but the experience, the living experience of the culture, to push it into the foreground a little bit for all kinds of reasons that we theorize on the Tinai Creole as extremely important for the current moment, you know, for resistance, for understanding that culture in India is not monolithic, um, it's not monolingual. A, there are all kinds of things going on, and uh, Pondicherry is is and has been for a long time, and is and should be at the vanguard of showing people about an alternative to received notions of India, which is not actually alternative at all. It is actually central. It's just that those exactly. received notions of India are pushing their versions in the front, and everything else is going to the side. No, let us push. Well. We will put our stuff out there so that we show people that we are we are actually equally legitimate, equally uh, dis, you know equally uh, representative of what India can and should be. So um, absolutely, everyone. Mark is here. Mark, you are Very you well. are leaving your trail in Roma. Don't make us so jealous, Mark. Something you know, some nazar, some bura nazar will fall on you someday. <laughs> <laughs> We are all, you know, like envying your Roman sojourn, you know. <laughs> Pondicherry is indeed a melting pot, Anita. Um, absolutely. Us three, hello. Hi, nice to see Malcolm. you. Welcome. Long uh, time. And uh, absolutely, Celine, it's very interesting. Now, this is also a bit archipelagic. Absolutely. Because why has Lomaton suddenly woken up to Pondicherry? That maybe if Ari wants to talk about it, he can. I, I leave it to you, Ari. No, you see, the, the, the person who is running the collection, the collection he, he is always looking for some new areas. Yeah. Right? And when he came to know about me, and when he, I sent him the first uh, short story, which is Vidi, he immediately said, man, this is really absolutely fascinating. I never read anything like this. Uh, on, 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 on India, first of all. And then again, he just came to know that Pondicherry was there and Pondicherry mm -hmm. was Francophone, Pondi Pondicherry was French. So mm -hmm. we had a couple of discussion and then he said, okay, listen, since you opened the, you, 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 you're gonna publish it, what do you wanna do? And I said, this is what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. And immediately I, I introduced him the second author from Pondicherry, who is going to be published soon, uh, I hopefully in the come couple of months. So she's the second person um, uh, from Pondicherry who is going to be. He already published in Larmatham, but it was like more like a academical book. It's okay. not a fiction, you see? Okay. Okay. And so this is the first time that a fiction comes from that person and is going to be published. Fantastic. So I'm going to introduce a third person also, but I'm working on the on the on on the stories. So yeah. 
So now we are really very, very generous of you, Ari, to spend time, you know, promoting uh, people like this. It's uh, that's I mean, I know that that's your personality and your character. But I think one has to agree that not many people spend time promoting other people in this world. Mostly we see people trying to run down people and, and, and eliminate people from so-called competition you know, which is a very stupid way of, I think, living in the world. But uh, unfortunately, that's very common. And I think it should be, you should be commended for uh, taking care, you know, of others, other writers, and, and mm. making sure that they, they, they also achieve their dreams. And uh, not only that, that Pondicherry and its culture also, you know, it's a win-win situation. Um, a big publishing house in France. Because, is you know, I'm sure after some time, people will be bored by reading only me. See, after three, four books, it's okay. We know Ari Goche, okay. We know his style. We know what he's going to say. So, you know, and then people will get bored after Pondicherry also. So I don't want to take that risk. No, and, and you know, uh, to, to get back to La Matin, it's also a way of uh, decolonizing a very big French publishing house, um, you know, uh, because uh, they also must, I mean, this is it. A book cannot exist without the market. I mean, these are the material conditions of the book of publishing course. industry. So they also, there has to be a receptivity somewhere uh, in the publishing world for these books to even enter the, the, the kind of vision, you know, of, of, of the publishers. So all this is a very interesting um, set of developments, I think, which is uh, only going to... Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be beneficial for a whole lot of reasons, for a whole lot of people. But speaking about the melting pot of Pondicherry, you know, my God, look at my reading list. <laughs> you want to see mine? <laughs> I'm just here. So let, let's let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you start. You start. You start. You start. <laughs> Oh my God, the Prabhanchan, Prabhanchan, Prabhanchan book is, uh, I think, in my bedroom. I'm, re I'm trying to. I can see Dana, Dana Agmon, Colonial yes. Author, first. Yes. Amazing book. Amazing book. book I recommend to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best books I ever read on the Nainiapa affair. But you, 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 you say some, some words because it's. Well, I haven't yet started. I've only received. Oh, you have not started. Book. You have not started. But you know, as I said, as I said, as I said in the book, what is very interesting that French was not the language for trade. <laughs> huh? So what does that mean? What does that mean? Le jeune. No, but there was someone, someone, someone comment before that. Yes, I am. I'm. I don't know what the person is. Uh, no, this is some somebody is spamming us. People, this person is spamming us. I can't control uh, this person because I'm now <laughs> not. Impressed. Please, let's not <laughs> let's not give if I could lay in la. That's why I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there is a spam. Someone is. These are you. assignments for us. Put up the titles, Manuela. Hi, Manuela. Uh, Good to see you. Brother. So okay, so Dana Agmon. Dana Agmon. There. Um, is about, um, it's a micro history about uh, the uh, so-called Nainiapa affair in the French colony of Pondicherry, India. The surprising and shifting fates of Nainiapa and his family from the, form the basis of this story of global mob mobilization replete with merchants, missionaries, local brokers, government administrator, administrators, and even the French royal family. So I'm very interested in this uh, uh, in this montayu like tale of uh, Pondicherry, or so it sounds. You are going. You have recommended it highly. And Manuela, yes, hi, lovely to see you back with us. I know we were. We know you were busy last hi, time. You were, you were in Italy, uh, traveling and teaching. So, um, so this is Dana Agmon. Okay. Um, then we have uh, this massive tome, people. It's not a slim book. Um, speaking of merchants, the merchants and the state, the French in India, 1666 to 1739 by Anirudha Ray. This is also a book that you like. Yeah, I, I got, I I got four, four of them. You, you got in one. I have four of them. Okay, never mind. Yeah. No, it's, I have it's four good. one, the volumes. Volume one. Uh, this is which, which volume is that? 
Oh my God! There are four volumes. Yeah, this is only one volume. <laughs> this is volume two. Yeah. So you you you, you got it wrong. There are four volumes. <laughs> that's four, four volumes. That's a lot of reading. That's a lot of reading about the. No, it's an excellent book, but it's too technical for me. But it's too technical. But it's nice to it's nice to know the the the, the story of the, the the merchants and how the the company descent uh, yes. used to you, you used to operate. Then we have this. Yeah, I'm sure. This is a new one. <laughs> same pinch, same pinch as we said in India. Same pinch. <laughs> That's also a very good one. This is fantastic. Um, so the late Indrani Ray, you know, one of these, one of these Bengali polyglots, you know, reading her biographical sketch, I was reminded of myself. Um, as a lecturer in Boshanti Devi College, she acquired considerable mastery over the French and German languages from Alliance Française and Max Müller Bhavan. I mean, that's how we learned our French and German. I was 16, you know. I'd finished my class 10 and I was waiting for my exam results. It was hot. What do you do? So somebody told my parents or my, I can't remember. It's like, go and learn German. Okay. Every morning I would land up at the Max Müller Bhavan and uh, which is our Goethe Institute. Spent five hours every morning enjoying the air-conditioned <laughs> cool <laughs> Max Muller Bhavan and learning and learning German. It was the best, best uh, thing I ever did. So many decades later, almost 30, 40 decades later, I was sitting in uh, in Berlin uh, with the at dinner with the head of the Goethe Institute <laughs> all, all, all uh, world oh, over. Oh, no. Yeah, he was sitting at the table with me. And uh, because, you know, it was something to do with the Humboldt Prize, whatever. Anyway, it was something, some big event. So he asked me, uh, where did you learn your German? And I said, when I was 16 at the Goethe Institute at the Max Müller in India, he was so happy. He was like, look, <laughs> <laughs> and she's now got the Humboldt Prize. Anyway, so then, you know, a few years later, again, I had a little break, went off to um, do French at the Alliance Francaise. And this is the way we learned our languages. And of course, you know, well, you everybody knows what happened to my French after that. <laughs> you saw me cooking fondant today. Anyway, she, Indrani Ray, went on to do a PhD at the Sorbonne. And um, she has an immense number of essays and unedited papers, which she died very suddenly. But uh, Lakshmi Subramaniam, who's also, of course, an extremely eminent historian, edited and it's a beautiful window onto Chandanagar and uh, onto the, you know, as you said, Ari, to uh, to Kumbayanwar in on your page. Uh, Pondicherry, of course, we think we know. I mean, there's a lot there. But when you want to also know about Chandanagar, there perhaps isn't that much, you know, at hand. And uh, this, there are some fantastic essays, detailed essays about duplex in Chandanagar, uh, about different sorts of things, machinations going on in Bengal. Chandanagar versus Calcutta, which is a very important, I think, set of discussions to have. Um, uh, and the fact that the French, I mean, this Anglo-French rivalry, how it's reflected in Bengal, you know. Um, and so this is another very interesting- What is, what is one more important, very interesting in that it's the uh, duplex private business. Yes, so when, business, yeah. When, yeah. You, when you read that, you understand how that man who was dreaming to become the Nabab of, uh, the, of India couldn't even run a proper business. Yeah, yeah. That's what Asia, <laughs> Asia wants to be. And of course, our lovely Jyoti Mohan's book has finally arrived. This is a fantastic book again. You know, it's a very good book. Um, it's really about French Indology basically. So, you know, I, I also, again, all this has arrived in the last few days, so I haven't had a chance to look at it. But I'm Morgan is, is, She's excellent. I mean, I, I, I love her work and from the uh, almost for five years, I, I know her. She sent me the first essay, that this one, and I really fell in love with her works. It's beautiful. Amazing. And uh, bonsoir, bonsoir. Um, uh, but uh, I suppose then Jyoti's book is about like people like I don't know Uncle Duperon and you know such such. Come on. Uncle Duperon. Oh yeah 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 oh, yeah oh, Uncle Till Duperon yeah. I, yeah. I think uh, Jyoti, uh, Blake Smith and uh, Jessica Namakal they are all like the same. Yes. Kind of yeah. uh, gang I would say. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think Celine had a question for you. Est-ce que vous nous résumez comment la compagnie des Indes opérait d'après cet ouvrage? Okay. Oh mon Dieu, c'est <rire> <Céline, rire> une, 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 une énorme question, euh, mais qui est très intéressant parce que, comme je disais, il y a quatre, quatre volumes euh, à, sur la compagnie des Indes, comment euh, elle a commencé, comment elle a été. Euh, ils ont, Comment, comment, comment ils l'ont fermé après quelques années pour la réouvrir une, une deuxième fois. Euh, donc, c'est assez, assez complexe et compliqué, mais c'est intéressant de savoir comment aussi toutes les négociations qui se sont faites à travers la compagnie Zen, parce que quand, quand on parle de Pondichéry, par exemple, on, euh, le, 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 la narration toute simple est de dire euh, « les Français sont arrivés, François-Martin est arrivé », le, le, comment on appelle ça, euh, le nawab de Genji, de Arkad. Genji, il a laissé un terrain, un, un petit morceau de, de, de terrain en, à Pondichéry et ils ont construit le fort. But it's not that. It's not, you know, when you read that book, you understand how difficult it was for them to get that small area and also kind of, it, it was not a, like a straight, a straightforward negotiation. You know, because they were helping him to fight a war, yeah. and and because uh, the 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 king of Jinji owes owed some money to the French people, he didn't know how to give them back the money. So he said, "Okay, take a piece of land." So that is how it happened. It's not like okay, I can take take a piece of land and run, run your show. So c'est un c'est un livre très très intéressant, mais. Uh, il faut beaucoup de temps pour le lire, c'est-à-dire ça quatre, euh, quatre tomes, ils sont énormes et euh, les, tous les détails sont, sont magnifiques. Well, it, but it's going to be complicated if it's four, if it's four volumes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was looking at the size of the first, you know, this is, this is for historians like our Emma. They are the ones who can deal with such tomes. They write such tomes and they can deal with such tomes. The rest <laughs> have to deal with digests. Speaking of digests, oh, then I have then also have two other books that I want to uh, show people. The first, of course, is finally I got um, the uh, English translation of a quite a, um, a kind of uh, what can you say um, pioneering, a kind of important uh, work uh, in Tamil from Pondicherry by Prapanchan called Beyond the Sky in English. Vanam something or the other. Vanam Vasaparam. Okay, thank you. Vanam Vasaparam. Okay, I remember Vanam because of the Creole uh, expression, uh, Vanam Poidichi. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the point about this book is I was very keen to read it because as a literary critic, it's important, you know, for me to understand what's coming out of Pondicherry apart from Ari Gautier. <laughs> Of course, you know, we, we don't want actually to be, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm afraid uh, after it's like these, um, you know, uh, like these Sufi wanderings, you know, you wander around the world and in the end you reach your manzil, your destination, which continues to be Ari Gautier. It doesn't matter how much of Prabhanjan one reads. But the Prabhanjan book has unfortunately been translated very badly. Uh, Sahitya Academy uh, commissioned the translation. It is awful. I don't have any problem saying it in, in public. It is so bad that it is doing the book and the trans and the uh, lang I mean the original language no justice at all. It's a very boring Oh my God, I'm really kidding myself. But it's a boring book. I mean, Prabhanjan has read the diaries of um, Ananda Ranga Pillai and he's giving a very vivid account of Ananda Ranga Pillai who like Nanyapa is a dubash, is a, is a, is a go-between, uh, a, a translator between duplex and, and all the other people around him. So it's, it could have been quite uh, dramatic, you know, like entry point into, into those, those kind of machinations and those kind of, you know, uh, all these different people again, fighting over, uh, these territories in order to gain a foothold, you know, to get uh, the, the mastery over over these spaces for for the for the trade and for ultimate colonial domination of India. But I don't know. It is exceedingly dull. I always had this conversation or con con debate or with uh, with Prabhanjan that uh, you know uh, because it one of the first books which was returned uh, about Pondicherry out in the public, 
and I mean, historically, sorry. So I think he, he, it was a success. But I always, uh, when I talk to, I used to talk to Prabhupada, um, now he's, he's gone. And Jody Morgan, yes. <laughs> and uh, I said, I mean, you, you, you wrote the entire book based on only Ananda Ranga Pillai diary. And knowing Ananda Ranga Pillai, and I mean, I, I can't take it. Uh, it's kind of, for me as a writer, I will never write a book based on Ananda Ranga Pillai's diary. Yes. Well, you know, I mean, I have to read it. I have no, as I think, Jyoti, you were referring to Prabhanchan's book, I, 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 I think, or maybe you were referring to the four volumes of Aniruddha, right? I don't know. But uh, honestly, uh, if, as scholars, Jyoti, you know very well what I'm talking about. We have no option. We, we have to read what's out there. Otherwise, our argumentation and our positioning is incomplete, you know, so however much we may know where our Creole Manzil lies, we still have to make the detours down these rather un, un uh, no, but you know, it, It's very, it's very, very, uh, very important what you do, uh, Ananya, in the sense like, uh, yeah. Yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> the four volumes I go through. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, doing doing that. Yeah. I'm doing that. <laughs> And and no, so it's it's really important what you do, Ananya, in the sense that you know, when since you are interested in Pondicherry, right? Just not like based on only one writer which is out there, but going through the entire uh, the different writers who have been writing about Pondicherry uh, on, on a fictional thing, and it's very that, that's how a serious researcher or academic do does. So that I, I really appreciate that. And, so, uh, you yeah. know, we have no option. I mean, this is called uh, this. I mean, if you have to uh, stand up in, in an academic, uh, you know, uh, the more the more daring uh, one has to be or one wants to be, the more risks one wants to take, the more of those dry reading that Jyoti is talking yes, about you have to do. We have no option. So, <laughs> you know, um, I'm very, very happy. Uh, yes, Jyoti, uh, thank you. I did uh, search long and hard and I managed to get the Saiti Academy English translation. But as I said, it's not up to standard, uh, unfortunately. So maybe one day somebody will do a new translation because it is important academically at least for us to read it, you know, um, but it is at the moment, it is a torture for me. Now, uh, this book, on the other hand, is was anything but a torture. And I raced through it in like one evening. I was so captivated by it. Um, now, this is uh, very scholarly, but also very accessible. So it's a very interesting mix of, of these possibilities. So the book is by someone called Paul van der Velde, and it's, uh, he's, um, he's Dutch, Dutch academic historian, I imagine. Um, and he uh, translate, edited, he edited the volumes of this 18th century uh, traveler in India, uh, Jacob uh, Hafner, and um, whom he's calling an anti-colonialist. Um, and Jakob Hafner, uh, fascinating life of this man. Uh, so he was obviously in India, in the East, because of the Dutch East India Company. And uh, before I, I go on to talk about the, the man, I just want to say what how this book came into being. So Jakob Hafner lo wrote loads. I just don't know how people in those centuries, they just managed to produce, they wrote, you know, with pen and mm -hmm. I mean, even Augustine, you know, the the our, our the church father wrote these enormous tomes. I mean, in the in the so-called dark ages, you know, in antiquity, they were writing large tracts, city of God, etc. So people who want to write, they don't. It doesn't depend on technology. They will write on tablets. They will write on manuscript, whatever. But so so Hafner wrote a lot a lot of very interesting and very lively narratives of his travels in the East. India, Ceylon, Batavia, even uh, starting with, uh, with Cape Town, you know. So uh, all the places he visited, um, he wrote about. 
and he was very fond, obviously, of his of of the of, of these places, which is why Paul van der Velde calls him an anti-colonialist. Um, now um, Hafner um, wrote these books. They were there, obviously, in a kind of a, a old-fashioned Dutch. I mean, it's from the 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, the the uh, the editorial work has been done by Paul van der Velde, um, but what he then did is decided that they were so interesting that he had to make a kind of redaction of them. So he wrote a kind of biography of uh, Jakob Hafner in Dutch, interspersed with long passages, choice passages picked from Hafner's many tomes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then someone called Lisbeth Benink has translated it in really good English. So this, ultimately, this book, I think, came out earlier this year. And I, um, uh, when was it published? 2020, last year. So okay. yeah. I'm very thrilled at um, my, having my hands uh, on, this, on this book, which is full of excellent illustrations, obviously, from the, from the original uh, tomes. Um, this is the man when he was young. Daka. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> one thing which is very fascinating about Hafner is that I don't know whether he, he was in love with the East or in love with the women of the East. He had very many paramours. Every time he went somewhere, he fell in love. <laughs> and there was always some some drama, you know, and then, you know, it never it never came together. And then he he kind of went to another place. It's almost like, you know, as a literary critic, I see this beautiful fusion between his desire for otherness and desire for these women, and uh, how he used um, both these these um, you know both, both both these entry points into into mm -hmm. the world of the other to to kind of you know. Um, to understand the other, um, I don't think this is a. <laughs> I don't think this is anything to feel uh, like to castigate him about. How do we get to know the other through love, through affection, through friendship, through curiosity? So you know, it's very really sure. relatable um, that he goes here and there, and he, you know, every time he wants to learn about something, he falls in love with somebody there. The most interesting uh, thing is he starts off with. Um, very sad. I have to tell. I have to tell everybody about this. The 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 ur scene, as they say in German, of his passion, unrequited passion for the worlds of uh, non-Europe. Shall we put it this way? Uh, so he actually um, arrived, and um, the first journey he made um, was when he was only twelve with his father, and it was uh, to. Uh, towards Batavia via Cape Town. But just as the ship uh, uh, was coming into Cape Town, his father, who was ill, died. So the young boy disembarked uh, in Cape Town as an orphan, you know. So this was the start of his adventures. And then he was uh, kind of like taken in by some people there, Dutch people, and you know. Anyway, he, uh, he, he, went off to Batavia, he came back to uh, to the Cape, etc. So by the time he's back in the Cape, he is uh, 16, okay? And <laughs> he loves plants. He loves, he's very attracted to the exotic. And you know, if anybody's been to, have you been to Cape Town? Have you been to no. South Africa? So, you know, the Table Mountain has the most amazing plants, the proteas. Anybody who goes there, must be fascinated by them because they're very small and they're very varied because you know up on the mountain there's this strong wind and everything is flattened out so the proteas are growing very close to the ground they develop a special you know kind of um uh, like it's like the marsupials of you know kangaroos and wallabies of, mm -hmm. of the couches this is the equivalent you know the proteas this uh, they have some strange animal um, some strange botanical forms so anyway he went off there to um collect um plants Jacob had developed a fascination for plants and he often went to the Table Mountain to look for rare species. Coming to the other side of the mountain one day, I saw a young Hottentot, you know, we are not supposed to say Hottentot anymore, but colonial guy. I saw a young Hottentot of girl of exceptional beauty. She belonged to the few remaining independent Hottentot tribes that lived at the outermost boundaries of the colony. These are the Khoi Khoi, you know. They had come to the Cape to complain to the government 
about the arbitrary behavior of the tyrannical Boers and to ask justice for their suffering. This is, uh, uh, this is Jacob. He is actually talking about mm -hmm. the tyrannical Boers and the suffering of, of the Hottentots at the hands of his fellow colonizers, his fellow Dutch, you know, white people. It seems as though she had seated herself there to enjoy the vastness and to view the flag that had just announced the vicinity of a ship at sea. So imagine these two young people on the table mountain, one a koi koi girl, the other this white Dutch lad, you know. When she became aware of me and saw what I was doing, she got up and helped me search. When I had collected a sufficient amount, I sat down to rest, tired from the climbing and the heat. Without a trace of fear, she sat directly next to me. She took the cloth with which I wiped my sweaty torso from my hands and wiped it over my hand with clear pleasure. Imagine, this girl is just wiping his face. Aside from the, aside from the disgusting mixture of grease and soot with which she, like every other Hottentot, was covered, she was the most charming and most attractively shaped woman that you can imagine. <laughs> She had a full countenance with very charming features, a row of shining white teeth and a fiery wide open eye. The well-proportioned limbs and her shapely bosom <laughs> made her one of the rare beauties in which nature had already collected all her art <laughs> to compensate for the general ugliness of her nation. So the colonial <laughs> is not so enamored that he's finding her a representative of the beauty, rather she's an exception, but nevertheless, he is totally enamored of her. I spoke to her in Dutch, which she didn't understand. And she answered me in the Hottentot language, which I didn't understand. After we tried to contact each other through signs, I was getting ready to leave. Basically, this woman through sign language told him, come back tomorrow. And he, um, after a brief interval in which her earlier friskiness turned to sadness, she ran her hand over my face and then ran with incomprehensible speed down the mountain and disappeared beneath behind the bushes. I did not know what to think of this meeting. Captain Hansen and his wife, these are the people he was staying with, to whom I told the story, laughed heartily and wished me luck with my Hottentot conquest. Nevertheless, I went back to my meeting place the following morning. But how great was my disappointment. Koi Koi, camp, everything was gone. They had left at the earliest dawn. They were indignant. And they, so later he understood that basically the government hadn't, uh, uh, hadn't really, you know, they, they were not happy with the negotiations. So the whole camp left. Obviously, this girl had to go with them. She's not going to be able to stay back. When I arrived at the meeting place, I found a row of beads that she wore around her arms, leg and neck. She had probably put them there when she realized that she had to leave suddenly with the intention that I would find and keep them. I took them with me in any case, and this was the only memento that I kept of my hot and top sweetheart. Yeah. This was our 16 year old Jacob in love for the first time with the other. And she. That's very, that's very, that's very interesting. So sweet. And the, she, she loved the beads, and he kept the beads. Now, this man obviously was not dis too disappointed for too long because like the proverbial sailor, everywhere he went, he had some sort of a, a relationship, but he loved them. He was not, I mean, the way he writes about them, it's not that he was just, you know, I mean, okay, I mean, one can have any kind of relationship. That's not a judgment, but he sincerely was in love with these women. He was in love with some Devdasis. He was in love with a Metis, a Topaz woman in Pondicherry who was from Goa, just like the women in your books. And then when he went to Jaffna, he was in love with another Topaz woman there um, called Anna, uh, all sorts. So, you know, he he gave his heart to these women and learned about about their about them. You know, he learned to be to be something other than himself through his uh, mm -hmm. romantic, uh, liaisons. I, I think this is uh, very, um, yes, Celine Charmont. Um, uh, Emma, this is the late 18th century. Um, and uh, this, this man, I'll give you his dates in a second. Ever the historian, she wants to know dates. The rest of us are dying with the love beats. She <laughs> <wants to. laughs> Francesca, 
Hello, lovely to see you. So anyway, the point is that um, I'm very interested in this book because uh, he, he then comes to India. And he is, you will know about this uh, Dutch uh, port or fort in the south, Sadras. Sadras, yeah. Yeah. So, which is now, I think, just there's nothing there except for some ruin of the Dutch fort. Or maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not like Pondicherry. Like, it, it, it didn't continue to be no. uh, or become an important place. It just, uh, it's just a kind of remnant of the past. But at that time, when Jakob Hafner arrives, it's very lively. So um, uh, Hafner tells you all about the culture of, um, of parties and balls and food and whatnot in Sadras. From Sadras, he then goes to Calcutta, to, to Chandanagar, actually. Uh, he goes to Calcutta as well. He comes to Pondicherry. He, he is moving up and down the coastline. Um, and um, the excerpts that uh, Paul van der Velde takes are very satisfying, I must say, because he really takes the juice, you know, from these encounters. Mm -hmm. and you can get enough of an idea of the life of uh, the Creole life of these places, which accords very well with the ideas that you and I are, 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 are you know, are articulating and um, how you write about these places, how I'm theorizing about these places. You know, it is people like him who were the connector of these places to make the archipelago of fragments that we talk about. Absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Emma, Emma, don't, uh, <laughs> don't justify that. I'm teasing you and you're teasing me. But let me give you the dates. Uh, Ari, isn't this amazing? The hot and taut love beads. Oh, my God. My heart is, my heart is, you know, he has my, uh, you know, he has my heart, Jakob Hafner. 1754 is when Hafner was born in Halle, in, in, now in Germany. Um, moved with his parents to Amsterdam when he was 10. 1765 and in 1766 when he was 11 uh sorry he was 12 together with his father on the voc ship to uh cape town which is where his father died and then he lived with his foster parents in cape town um in for a couple of years and he uh, departed for batavia to become a tutor in Batavia because very interesting in Batavia there was a need for tutors because the young Creole children that were being born in Batavia to the Dutch families needed tuition in Dutch. So he went there to give tuition in Dutch, but um, he, um, he was bored. He was too bored to just being a tutor. So he then um, rushed off, um, found uh, a way to travel by sea to India. And uh, in 1789, he first arrives in India as a free burger in Nagapatnam. And then from 1780, he arrives in Sadras to be a private bookkeeper. So very, very uh, learned professions requiring reading and writing, you know, bookkeeper, tutor. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, goes off uh, from 1783. He's in Jaffna love affair with Anna Vider, who is some kind of a Metis woman, uh, travel through Ceylon, Coromandel. Then he has an affair with Mamia, who's one of these... Uh, dancing girls, you know, the buyer there. And uh, that's also very, uh, very elaborated. Uh, this, uh, then he goes to Mauritius. Where has this man not been? Um, another Anna enters his life, Anna Maria Kreonik. Um, that's uh, when he goes back, finally. When he returns to Amsterdam, he returns because he's out of money. Uh, something happens. I can't remember the story. But when he returns to Amsterdam, he's bored. He hates it. He says, who would like to live in Europe when you have seen the light of the East. Um, he tries his best, but uh, nothing works. Um, and he marries, he has a couple of children. Uh, he dies in, uh, he, he lives quite a longish life for somebody who's so well-traveled. So when does he, uh, when does his life end? Where's his, uh, yeah. So he dies in 1809. Well, you know, not a bad life, 1754 to 1809. And um, after that, his son starts, uh, continues the job of publishing his travel, uh, father's travelogues and so on. So a very, very interesting person. And I suspect not such an outlier. I think there were many like him who really enjoyed their time in the East and what it afforded them. 
And the other thing which is very important for us, like Anthony Ferengi, Jakob Hafner learned a lot of languages. He learned Tamil, he could speak Bangla, he knew Hindi, um, etc. And he um, was very thrilled whenever somebody mistook him for a Creole of the lands. You know, people mistook him for somebody who was born in India. And this is the other important point that, you know, a life like his makes, that there were many such people. There were distinctions. So the, there was a Creole population in diff, augmented in different ways, you know. And this Creole population was becoming, was, was one that was Creole by birth and Creole by filiation because Hafner was not born in anywhere. He was born in Europe but he creolized himself, you know. So you buy this book, Ari, because you're going to love it. Sorry, I've carried on a monologue about half an hour for about three, <laughs> uh, 15 minutes. Sorry to bore everybody, but I'm entranced by this man and his and his love for all these women of the, of the East. <laughs> I, I was timing that exactly, exactly 22 minutes. <laughs> sadras is exactly how you spell it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sadras. No, also, yeah. yeah, I also didn't know about it, but it's Sadari Patnam or something. There's some Patnam. Yeah, Sadari Patnam. It's, yeah. I think it was clo close to the pull pull card. Pull yeah. Card pull card, yeah. I mean, if you see if you see the map from Pulikart down, Pulikart, Pondicherry, then I think Sadra, exactly. uh, then you go further down, Karikal. Uh, it's then exactly you... like that um, Al Alambare Fort, uh, close That's to right. the, between yes. between Chennai and yes. and Pondicherry. Yes, it was very flourishing port uh, for for some time, and then suddenly nothing. It just got closed. So, yes, uh, yeah, uh, it, it it was similar to the men who meant native uh, imperialist. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, there is. Yeah, things things happen. Of course, Th these are moments. They, they don't remain the same. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, as the colonial enterprise consolidates itself, positions become reified. Um, imperialism uh, becomes more of a matter of Manichaean binaries um, and so on. Of course, we know very well how this happens in the case of British India, because that coincides also with the development of the British Empire, which become more or less radiant all over India. So yeah. it's easier to kind of see the um, how one development leads to another, you know. But it's very interesting that uh, the question is what happened to these outliers? You know, what happened to um, to the to the lines uh, from from Dutch, uh, you know, from the Dutch um, uh, VOC to to thinking about India and so on. But you know, these these are the kinds of stories that are very fascinating, and we are trying to bring them into the foreground to complicate our our understanding of uh, of um, India and the European, uh, you know, India, Indian and European encounters, mm. um, which for us is. Is really what Creole India is about, um, Ari. I've been I've totally monopolized. Uh, Athenai. Uh, no worries. It will be I difficult think. for me to come after your very uh, come after some discovery. passionate uh, thing for <laughs> what is it? You 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 Goffner? No. Yeah, I'm almost <laughs> in love with Jakob Hafner himself. I'm like, what a yeah. lovely man. No, I I've been no no. I'm reading this book, which is. Very, very fascinating. Oh my God! All change come to the present. Yes. You see, Margaret Ross Barnett, the political of cultural nationalism in South India. So, on you know that Margaret Ross Barnett was the only black academic who has written about South India. Amazing. And, and uh, this is one of the, I mean, uh, classic to understand because, as you know, when I in my books, there's a lot of politics involved. I talk about the political um, environment and the political situation, and as you as you as you know, that if you don't, you cannot write a book without any cultural references. Yeah, yeah. You see, uh, uh, like for example, cinema, uh, literature, politics has to be part of mm -hmm. the, the narration in order to understand the 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 entire the entire picture. So the politics of cultural nationalism, why I bought this book is to understand the Dravidian movement, how it started and how, why Pontich uh, not Pontich why Tamilians are so passionate mm -hmm. about that idea of being Tamil, first of all, the Dravidian identity of Tamil and Dravidian and then Tamil as a, as a language. And um, 
paradoxically what is in, what is interesting the idea of dravidian came with through four white missionaries interesting see, interesting uh, caldwell pope and uh, bechi so they are the people who really uh, what he called uh, put the impulse of saying that you guys are dravidians they are the aryans so it's interesting that how this notion of identity come through missionaries and through colonial enterprise uh, so it's a it's an absolutely I, i would really recommend to read this book is really beautiful excellent and so uh, she's done a, can you tell me something uh, how does it sit alongside the books that we've been other books that been reading i mean for example sumati's book passions of the tang it's it's almost the same i mean the same caliber I would say I would say but she is more interested into the political movement the justice party study bit um, by peria mm -hmm. and up to up to uh, anadurai and uh, karnaniti so how that, that's uh, uh, yeah marguerite rose barnet bring it a little closer so that uh, yeah yeah super yeah so it's it's really really in interesting and i i like the way she go she goes into details y you know uh, sometimes it can be very technical because there's a lot of numbers and uh, different kind of person uh, like for example uh, this this type of uh, graph uh, it's, it's easy to read and for if someone is interested in the dravidian political movement I, I really recommend this. But by the way, Ari, you are pretty amazing, actually, as a as a as a <laughs> as somebody who finds. How do you find this? Je ne sais même plus. Je ne sais même plus. Pour être honnête, comment j'ai trouvé ça? No, but yeah, exactly. But you know, you uh, you know my 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 laptop. I always always am telling you, I got thirty windows open. I'm I'm not able to close them, and I'm I'm getting a little I'm 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 really kind of petrified by the idea. If I close them, I lose something. So I like to have thirty windows open, doing my research. So while doing my research, for one reason or the other, now I'm doing research about the Chetiyars and about the Marakayars. Mm -hmm. So there is ten windows for the Chetiyars, ten windows for the Marakayars, and ten windows for uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. political movements so this is how my have you read trotman's the yeah yeah i did i did i mean he is a great scholar also thomas yeah, trotman yeah. very very good scholar Absolutely. yeah um so there is of course a historical line you know i mean that's a very interesting uh, again most of us know that line as it stretches from william you know william jones into the idea of the uh, aryans but it's exactly. important to have the genealogy there about how did the dravidian idea then who brought that out and where did that what point did that enter the political discourse from the linguistic domain and so on so i think these are all fascinating uh, absolutely fascinating uh, you know issues and it's great to be able to join the dots uh, here on the thin night um, but um, but no i think are you're a great um, you're, you're a great hunter of 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 material oh, yeah. I, i love doing that interesting things you know? um i think uh, you need a research assistant so that they can take the notes and make the bibliographies and you don't have to worry about closing the windows <laughs> see to be honest yes i need to because you know i'm 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 such a messy guy uh, i keep on losing my my archives and if somebody asking me uh, some informations i'm not able to get it right away because i need to go into my files i am not my files are a mess so yeah please if uh, someone is interested to be my um, yeah, so my assistant my gutiya needs a research assistant i'm <laughs> sure there will be there will be a i don't know a deluge of requests now your inbox yeah, will by uh, talking talking about that maybe we should we should tell to our friends our uh, reading circle that we are starting yeah um, yeah you know new, new new person was joined the team so we should welcome her yes and so we haven't even had a first meeting with her but we are hoping yeah, yeah, we are yeah, hoping you won't frighten her away ha huh? <laughs> i hope you will not frighten her away ari shrishla konne man pa shrishla konne 
<laughs> um, I'm just teasing you. Oh, um, okay. okay. <laughs> no, I mean basically. You know, you know, you know what, while talking to, I know a guy. I will not reveal the name. Every time, and you know, he's a very common person, Don Juan. You know, charming playboy guy. So every time you meet a girl, the first thing said, "Hope I'm not impressing you." <laughs> Hope I'm not. I'm not too impressive. <laughs> Well, I mean, what is the reason that you bring up this anecdote at this? No, no, no. You just say that <laughs> she, she ran away after seeing me or something like that. So I mean, I hope we, will not. we have not yet had the first meeting. No, 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 no. Well, well, what we are doing is we are going to we, we are going to do a couple more things. I mean, the Revi. By the way, people, please, please, please go and check out the Revi, the Revi, uh, Tina Revi. Please read our stories there. put your claps you know whatever um because it's like the it's like the thing i creole the more we have evidence of people's engagement with it the better it is for us that we can keep it going so what we want to do with the revy the next issue of the revy in about a month's time we are going to collect a few uh, writings on lakshwadeep because lakshwadeep is in the news for all the wrong reasons but we realize we know nothing about lakshwadeep actually so there are some young scholars uh, we are collecting them we are mobilizing them and we are going to have a dossier of 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 absolutely brand new work absolutely okurong research which is happening right now hot of the press basically in progress research it's going to be given to us in in little you know um uh, sort of like you know medium sized uh, stories about you know what what we you know information Lakshadweep for all of us, um, but connected with that, um, we also um, decided to start up the Malabar Study Circle, uh, the Creole Malabar Study Circle. Again, I mean, these are all about sharing resources. It was just an idea. I threw it on my Facebook page, and it was like received with huge enthusiasm by a lot of people. So we are setting this up. The same new person uh, is working uh, both on the Tinai Revi and on the Malabar Malabar Study Circle. And what we want to do is, I think we're going to just um, uh, create a group and work out a way so that people can access maybe through Zoom. You know, we will read together once a month. Uh, a text about the Malabar, you know, um, an academic text or something, and we will have somebody uh, come to talk. Maybe the author of the text would come to talk to us about it and give some context. So that's going to be the Malabar uh, study circle, um, and um, we're going to probably set it up sometime in the summer. No, Ari, because already yeah. June, yeah. so uh, yeah. probably August or July. But it'll run once a month. So we are and fixing up now the. the, the, the also, this, this time we we decided not. take a longer break uh to to uh, to study ourselves so we 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 going to take a longer break from uh, from from chennai and then i ada also and uh, and spend some time and reorganizing and also uh, do a little more study so in order that one we one we get back so you know we are other uh, interesting to uh, things to share with you yeah exactly exactly so anyway on that note guys let's let's start saying goodbye we we as usual trespassed beyond the hour so it's But before really we leave saturday uh, our tinai matani uh, with two movies uh, yeah two movies right yeah two movies what we do is on wednesday evening people we are going to make the yeah. two films by surabhi sharma available one is called jahaji music it's about her um travel to trinidad and uh jamaica jamaica uh, filming alongside professor tejaswini niranjana um uh, professor niranjana was writing a pioneering book on um uh, you know called mobilizing india on indo trinidadian female musicians and all sorts of issues around gender and politics and ancestry and so on and she had a grant to create a film alongside her research amazing so surabhi uh, sharma who's a very accomplished filmmaker went was the person who got the the, the you know who, who who was chosen by uh, tejaswini to to do this uh, film so jahaji music with uh, remo fernandes 
And she took the Goan singer, Remo Fernandez, to make collaborations with the Trinidadian and Jamaican musicians. And they were not always successful. I mean, a very interesting documentary indeed about what happens when people of the diaspora and people of India actually encounter each other and try to, try to sing to the same tune or move to the same rhythm. Is it easy? Is it difficult? So that's Jahaji music, very fascinating uh, documentary. But uh, this topic then engaged Shurabi so much that she went on making different kinds of films about um, music of the indentured labor diaspora. But the second film we're gonna show is called Bidesia in Bombay. And it's about the same music from the same uh, Bhojpuri heritage, which circulates in India through migrant labor that moves in India, for example, to Bombay. So Bidesi and Bombay and Jahaji music are kind of the Indian and the mm -hmm. diasporic mm -hmm. versions of how songs travel with the Bihari Bhojpuri diaspora. And um, uh, very interesting pair. Um, we are going to have on Saturday, again, for reasons of, of availability, we are shifting and it's matinee, so it's okay. So Tina matinee. We, on Saturday afternoon, like we had with Celine and Cecile last uh, Saturday, uh, we're going to have Surabhi and Raj uh, Mohan, who is a really fantastic singer from Suriname of the same songs from the Bhojpuri heritage, and he lives in, in the Netherlands. So Raj and Surabhi are going to be regaling us um, on the topic of Girmitya Bhat. The, or I think Girmitya Geet. Sorry. It's, it's a good consciousness because this morning I posted that Silare Patu, you see? You did, you did, you did, yeah. So, Silare so, Patu, again, we are going to the same uh, indentured labor's uh, music. And uh, Rani Murthy asked if uh, I know anyone who was still uh, singing these songs. Uh, I said, no, unfortunately, I don't. But I told her that if she's, if she's, uh, she wants to use it, she's, she should feel free. And you know that Shailesh, Shailesh Bahoran, who is also Surinamese, Hindustani, Dutch, and uh, one of our one of our Tinai people, he's a dancer, a choreographer. He wanted to uh, use yeah. the this very similar. So, people out there, if anyone is interested to use those that Silere uh, Patu, uh, please feel free. And Silere Patu, for people who don't know Tamil, is yeah. basically the song. Silere Patu is a song composed, composed on board or when they when they when they arrive. To the, yeah. to, to the place. And so this Silare Patu was given to me by uh, by a Vatyalu, uh, which called Vatyar, uh, from Godloop, which I, I I came to know when I was in Pondicherry. I, I wrote that nice um, uh, story again for you, Ananya, if you remember. Or it, it was for, a, for an event, but it was for you also. It was and, for my... Uh, my uh, class, for my MA class. Can exactly. you tell me, guys, I'm so lucky and so are my students. My MA students to study Ari, Ari wrote a whole story for them. <laughs> and he wrote the story based on the Silere Patu. I actually think we should put it up on the Revit because it's a very beautiful story. And I translated it also, you know, because they had to read it in English. So I think we should put it on the Revit, no? No, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know what? I, I really like that exercise because as you know, each and every couple has a different story. Yeah. So yeah. I took the entire song. So these three couples have three different songs. From two from three different islands. Yeah. So what you did is you took the Silere part two, which you received in the form of three verses. And when the story that you wrote for my students, each verse has a kind of flash fiction attached to it. One goes, one is about um, a couple that's about to go uh, set off for Guadeloupe. Uh, the second is a couple that's on board and they are en route to Mauritius. And the third is about a young man who has all about a, uh, who has already disembarked in Fiji, and it ends with his grandson remembering his that young man who's now his grandfather. So it's a very very compressed but very interesting um, set of um, uh, you know uh, uh, flash fiction like tales which hang off each verse of the Silere Patu from the perspective of. A formal analysis for a literary critic, it's gold, you know, because verse and uh, prose are interacting, you know. Um, anyway, uh, people, um, we have been, I think we'll, we'll put it on the Revy so that people can enjoy it. I think mm. that's what the Revy's there for, to, as a showcase for, for these little bits and pieces. So, okay, everyone, let's, uh, let's say goodbye. Saturday afternoon, three o'clock.
and Wednesday the mo the movie will be online yeah. on our platform. Look out for the announcement on Thin I Creole for the password or whatever way we make the movies available. Please watch them, enjoy them, and come and join us on Saturday uh, with our guests uh, to talk about these these different kinds of transoceanic songs and their journeys both within India and outside of India and then back to Europe. Okay. All right, everyone. Bye bye. Uh, lovely. Uh, to yeah. see Thanks you. a lot. And bye, Ari. Thank you. See you next week. Oh, see you bye. Next bye. 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 bye.